All right, we're going to pick up today with the double revolution in Russia. By late 1916, the large but incompetently led and poorly equipped Russian army had experienced numerous defeats and had run out of ammunition and other essential supplies. The civilian economy was in a state of collapse, and the cities faced fuel and food shortages in the winter of 1916 and 1917. And what I want to show you on the next slide, you may want to pause it to review, is the entire system of what led up to the Russian Revolution with the Revolution of 1905, also called Bloody Sunday, the March Revolution, and the October Revolution. So after we finish the next slide, go through here. You're going to want to read through this because it is very important. However, the, the highlights are all here. The finer points are all here. So I'm not going to insult your intelligence by reading it all to you. But seriously, pause it. Go over it. Anyway, in March of 1917, which was February by the old Russian calendar, the Tsar Nicholas II was overthrown. And he was replaced by a provisional government led by Alexander Krensky. On November 6, 1917, Vladimir Lenin's Bolsheviks staged an uprising in Petrograd and overthrew the provisional government. The reason they overthrew the provisional government was because Kerensky made a deal with the French to stay in the war in exchange for money. And the reason that the city, the cities of Russia and the entire civilian economy was on the verge of collapse was because of this war. The money is not good enough for them to stay in the war. As a result, Trotsky's Bolsheviks are able to stage an uprising. Now, I remember these names, Vladimir Lenin, Leon Trotsky, and the infamous Joseph Stalin, or Joseph Stalin, as he's also called. Nicholas II wasn't quite innocent in the situation. He looted the treasury so he could return to power after he was forced to abdicate, which is a big no-no. But Nicholas never wanted to be the Tsar of Russia. He was a very private man. He enjoyed quiet time with his family. You can see them at the bottom. And he really couldn't have that as the czar. Now, you probably know a lot about the Roman family. The Romanovs are a very powerful, very old dynasty. And he is the last czar um, of Russia. Now, here's the thing. Let's talk for a minute about the family. So Nicholas's wife, Alexandra, is actually a descendant of Queen Victoria. And Alexandra brings the hemophilia gene with her she's a carrier and the only child she passes it on to is her son alexi who has a very severe case of hemophilia small bumps could cause internal bleeding and as a result alexandra is very very protective of her son she will do anything for him which is how a gregorian monk named gregory rasputin actually is able to weasel his way into the inner circle of the royal family now Aside from Alexei, Nicholas and Alexandra have Olga, Tatiana, Maria, and Anastasia as their four daughters. Alexei is the only boy. He's also the baby of the family. And Rasputin seems to be the only man who is able to calm Alexei down and to stop the internal bleeding. And that gets a reputation as a holy man or Satan's helper depending on whose side you were on. But that also fuels the rumors that there's something going on between Rasputin and Alexandra. There wasn't. But Rasputin did have a weakness for beautiful women, married or not married. And that made him a lot of enemies, aside from being so close to the royal family. And that's one of the reasons why when the, um, the, the Bolsheviks rise up, why they're able to gain so much support. When Rasputin is assassinated, one of the last things he ever says to Alexandra is, if I'm killed, you will die within a year. And that's exactly what happened. Rasputin is invited to a noble's house for dinner and entertainment in the form of a young, attractive woman. Um, only she's not there. It's a plot and he's poisoned. The food is poisoned. The wine is poisoned. And there's no effect on him whatsoever. Rasputin doesn't even feel a thing. But when he gets up, when he becomes suspicious, he gets shot and beaten. And the nobles congratulate themselves on killing Rasputin. Rasputin gets up and runs away. And they track him down and they stab him. He's dead. He's rolled into a rug, dumped in the river. And some bubbles appear. And there's Rasputin trying to swim to shore. But he ends up getting... 
um, hypothermic, and drowns. So despite the poison, the bullets, the beating, the stabbing, the attempted drowning, it is actually the cold water that causes his muscle to lock up, and then he does actually drown. The Romanovs are kidnapped. They are taken to a house by the Bolsheviks in the woods. They are kept under house arrest for months. And to make a long story short, one night they have to move because the white army, that is people who are on Nicholas's side, are coming to try to rescue the royal family. So they're moved. And then later, the red army officers come up to Nicholas and they say, Hey, we need to get a picture of you and the family for proof that you're still alive. So they're all brought down to the basement. It's the dead of night. All the Royal family is there, including the two servants that came with them as well as the family dog. And they're all lined up. Like they're taking a picture. Chairs are gotten for Alexandra and Alexei. And that's when the leader says you have all been found guilty of treason and you will be executed and then they were all killed by a firing squad in that room by 1921 vladimir lenin has a solid grip on russia with what will become the ussr so this is where you would want to pause it but i'm going to move on now here are the three leaders of major powers, we have Nicholas of Russia, George of England, Wilhelm of Germany. All cousins, guys, and especially these two in their side by side picture look a lot alike. But they are all descendants of Victoria. Moving along, the end of the war. When World War I started, the U.S. had a small army and was committed to neutrality. In 1916, with the signal of Lusitania and the Zimmerman telegram, results in the U.S. entering World War I in 1917. Germany resumed unrestricted submarine attacks on U.S. ships. And Goldman protested conscription as the U.S. entered the war. Germany was able to break through and push within 24 miles of Paris. The arrival of U.S. forces allowed the Allies to counterattack in August of 1918. The German soldiers retreated, and an armistice was signed on November 11th. The war ended that, that day with the signing, but it is the signing of this armistice and the conditions that Germany must meet that will eventually cause even greater problems, problems that people actually did see coming. So I want you to take a look. Territories that were taken away from Germany by allies after World War I. You have the formation of new countries. So you might want to pause this for a minute. Just take a look. What's new? The peace treaties, guys. <clears throat> the Paris Peace Conference was led by Wilson of the United States, George Clemenceau of France, and David Lloyd George of Britain. The U.S., Britain, and France each had different goals for the conference. Russia was not invited because um, Vlad Len Vladimir Lenin had agreed to pull Russia out of the war. That was how he was able to really solidify his power. Wilson hoped to implement a 14-point plan, as he called it, his 14 points, an idealistic view of international relations and establish a League of Nations. Others tried to influence the conference but were rebuffed or ignored. The Treaty of Versailles followed a few of Wilson's suggestions, but did not include a League of Nations. Because the three men had conflicting goals, the Treaty of Versailles turned out to be a series of unsatisfying compromises that humiliated Germany, but left largely intact the most and potentially the most powerful nation in Europe. The Austro-Hungarian Empire fell apart, and new countries were created in the lands lost by Russia, Germany, and Austro-Hungary. This is the agreement, guys. After Germany resumed unrestricted warfare, you know, that brought the U.S. in. But the treaty negotiated between January and June of 1919 in Paris was written by the Allies. No participation from the Germans. The negotiations revealed a split between the French, who pretty much wanted to completely dismember Germany. And that way it would make it impossible to renew a war with France. 
The British and the Americans did not want to create a pretext for a new war. But that's exactly what this treaty will do. League of Nations, that didn't happen. But part two gives Germany new boundaries. It takes away quite a bit of their territory. Part three, a demilitarized zone in Germany that would border other European countries, including France. Germany had no colonies. Germany had a very small armed forces. They could not also have certain classes of weapons. <clears throat> Germany was liable for the cost of the war. They had to accept responsibility for the war and its allies' responsibility for losses and damages against the Allied forces. There was no specified amount. Part 9, other numerous financial obligations has completely destroyed the German economy, especially when the Great Depression hits. Again, these are the clauses that will really cause Germany to eventually rise up as the strongest power in Europe, how they're able to take over, how they are able to make a mark in history, how Adolf Hitler is able to form the Third Reich. The impact of the war. Between 9 and 10 million people died in World War I, or at the time, the Great War. There was a million, what, millions of refugees who fled to France and the U.S., where the influx of immigrants prompted the U.S. Congress to pass immigration laws that closed the doors to Eastern and Southern Europeans. One byproduct of the war was the influenza epidemic. Now, here's the thing, guys. The influenza epidemic killed more people than World War I. It's also called the Spanish flu, but it lasted from 1918 to 1919. And it starts among the soldiers. And then as the soldiers go home from the Western Front, spreads around the world, killing 20 million people. In 1918, after Germany surrendered and Kaiser Wilhelm abdicated, the Republic reached a crisis that would truly come to a crisis in 1923. By 1925, the Weimar Republic, as Germany was called now, was recovering a bit. Redrawing the boundaries of Eastern Europe proved to be the most difficult of the post-war problems. Much of Eastern, Central, and Southern Europe drifted towards authoritarianism. <coughs> The 1920s were a decade of dissatisfaction among people whose hopes had been raised by the rhetoric of war and dashed by its outcome. In 1923, the French occupation had brought severe inflation into Germany, and it brought Germany to the brink of civil war. Fiscal reform, the creation of an American-led system to facilitate payment of war debts, and the French withdrawal marked the beginning of a period of peace and economic growth in 1924 in the Weimar Republic. We're going to stop there for today. Tomorrow, we're going to pick up with communism, not just in Europe, but as it expands to Asia. So if you have any questions, shoot me an email. Otherwise, have a great day, guys. Cheers.